Okay. We'll get started. Um, that's sort of what it looks like around here today. <laughs> so for the discussion this evening, we're going to talk about sutra, its roots, and expansion. Uh, and part of the reason for this is that people quite often, um, they have a, a, I guess, a mistaken view as to what sutra are. And so I thought that I would, I would give it a little bit more context. The three jewels of Buddhism are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And people often think of the Dharma as the teachings, philosophy, and guidance. In this context, sutra clearly contributes to Dharma. But sutra are not limited to this jewel. Sutra are involved in each component of the three treasures, and each jewel is interpenetrating with all the others. The subject is much more involved and cannot be described in one brief discussion. So this evening, I'm going to provide an overview as to what is considered sutra, how it developed, the difference between the Pali and the uh, Sanskrit sutra, and if successful, how sutra contribute not just to the teachings and the philosophy, but are integral to the process that we call Buddhism. There we go. Got to point it over that way. And just as a disclaimer, um, <laughs> this is going to be more of a scholarly examination. The authority and legitimacy of sutra is such that in some schools of Buddhism, the origin and authorship are not questioned. They are attributed to Shakyamuni Buddha and are considered as accurate as if there was a recording from which the original texts were transcribed. For the purpose of this presentation, I am assuming a more scholarly perspective in which I accept that the oral transmission is an incredibly accurate method of preservation of the teachings, but at the same time, the process of transcription and translation leaves the precise rendering of the works a subject of much debate among translators and different renditions of the same canonical work. Additionally, we are most often reading, reciting, and studying these works in English or another modern language in which further translation is executed from Pali, Sanskrit, Chinese, Korean, Japanese. As one might expect, there are words and terms for a single that for which a single word or sometimes even phrases is inadequate compared to the original due to the culture and worldview. There are schools of Buddhism in both Pali and Sanskrit tradition that maintain that the extant sutra are exact facsimile to the words spoken by Shakyamuni Buddha and others who gave the original discourse. I in no way impugn or wish to discredit this point of view. I am, however, open to a broader reading of the same sutra. What is sutra? You've probably heard Christians refer to themselves as people of the book. And of course, the book they're speaking of is their canonical work, the Christian Bible. I've even heard some Jewish people refer to themselves in the same way. This is somewhat of a misnomer since there are 24 books of Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. And in the Jewish, in, in the total of 66 books in the majority of Christian Bibles, in Buddhism, we use the concept of Buddhakana, word of the Buddha, and the Buddha is reported to have given over 84,000 sermons or discourses, and these were grouped into various categories. There's no single textual collection for all of Buddhism. Instead, there are three main canon, Buddhist canon, the Pali canon of the Theravada tradition, what is today the Theravada tradition, the Chinese Buddhist canon used in East Asian Buddhist tradition, and the Tibetan Buddhist canon used in the Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. In the Taisho Tripitaka, which is the Japanese, uh, what is the Japanese um, collection, and it's the edition, considered the definitive edition of the Chinese <coughs> Buddhist canon, and its Japanese commentaries has been used by scholars for the last 100 years, and it's contained in 85 volumes of literature and over 5,300 texts. Buddhist sutra are canonical works that are, re that are regarded oops. That's not there we go. Buddhist sutras are canonical works that are regarded as the rec records of the discourses given by Shakyamuni Buddha during his lifetime. 
As such, sutras are considered sacred texts in much the same way as the Abrahamic canon. They are not the revealed word of an omniscient deity. They are historical documents of profound wisdom and guidance. The term sutra designates Vedic, Buddhist, and Jain materials that come from aphorisms, rules, manuals, and texts. The origins and developments are traced to Buddhist and Mahavira literature from about 600 to 200 BCE. And the Indian tradition was almost exclusively oral until about the time of, the, of Buddhism's <coughs> introduction. Although the oral tradition was still considered superior, in the Indian subcontinent, the texts of Buddhists, Hindus, and Jains are still memorized. And a major distinction between the early civilizations of India and China is that the Indians regarded, regard oral tradition as superior, while the Chinese considers the written tradition superior. Thus, when we say that it's oral, we should understand that memorization was considered to be necessary for any practitioner in the Indian tradition and the ability to read and write became much more important in the Chinese tradition. The word sutra refers to a string or a thread, thus important words or brief phrases were strung together by analogy like a garland of flowers on a string. And as I say, Buddhist sutra adopted the form of Brahmanic text. These include the Shrata Sutra, which contains the official prayers of the fire ritual, considered Goma in Japanese. The earliest written forms were not committed to writing, uh, the earliest Buddhist texts were not committed to writing until centuries after the death of Gautama Buddha. The oldest surviving Buddhist manuscripts of the Gandharan Buddhist texts found in Afghanistan and written in Gandhari, and they date from the first century BCE to the third century CE. The oldest compilations were the five Nikayas of the Pali Canon, and it, which is the four Agamas of the Chinese <coughs> Canon, and these were written in the first century BCE. It is now known that several of Buddha's chief disciples, such as Shariputra and Madhulag, Madhulagyana, gave discourses at the request of Shakyamuni Buddha or when he was indisposed. And there's a story of the nun, Damadina, who had become an arhat, and her teachings are also included in the Buddhist canon. And she's considered the greatest preacher of all nuns and is revered by some as the second Buddha. Some sutra are said to be a record of the theological discussions between the Buddha and Hindu deities, such as Brahma and Indra, as well as demons. The first Buddhist council after Shakyamuni Buddha's death reported to be the event at which Buddhist sutra were first recorded, at least orally. It was the first they were retained and later written down about 300 years after his Parinirvana. And just to, to flesh that out a little bit, the tradition is that Ananda, one of his two disciples, Raul being the other, I mean, who is his, uh, uh, what's the term? Uh, attendance. Attendance. Raul being the other attendant, had a, an eidetic memory. And so Raul remembered all of his, all the discourses that Ananda had attended. And it's recorded that the night that they were going to invite Ananda to that gathering, but he had not yet attained awakening and only awakened people could attend. And so, lo and behold, the night before the gathering, hmm. he had a dream, and in that dream, he reached enlightenment, and he was able to attend. Thus, we have a record of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. It's important to keep in mind at this point that the Mahayana Sutras were being written at about the same time as the first written Pali text. And here we run into a problem as to when did the Bodhisattva Yana become Mahayana? The reason for this difficulty regards schools starting around the first century BCE. And for, for those who don't know the terms, Mahayana being one of the, the schools of, of thought of Buddhism and the Bodhisattva Yana are those who follow the Bodhisattva path, contrasted to the Shravaka Yana, those who follow the path of the Shravaka. Um, the reason for the difficulty regards the schools starting around the first century BCE and scholars have been aware for quite some time that such pivotally important Mahayana Buddhist thinkers, such as Nagarjuna, Dignaga, Chandrakirti, Aryadeva, 
Baba Babika, among others, formulated their theories while living in Buddhist communities existing during a schismatic period that might truly be Shravakiyana or might not truly be Shravakiyana or Bodhisattvayana. So from Chinese monks visiting India from 100 BCE to 100 CE, we know that the Mahayana and non-Mahayana non monks in India often lived in the same monastery side by side. The sutras in the Pali Canon. Nikaya Buddhism characterized the teachings into three, or Triptaka, the three baskets, Sutra Pitaka, Vinaya Pitaka, and Abhidharma Pitaka. Concerning Sutra, the oldest compilations were the five Nikayas of the Pali Canon, which becomes the Poragamas of the Chinese Canon. And these were written in the first century BCE. The, Nikaya, the Diga Nikaya, is a collection of long discourses. The Majima Nikaya is the collection of middle length discourses, and the Samyutta Nikaya is a collection of thematically linked discourses. And the Anubhitara Nikaya is the gradual collection, discourses grouped by content enumerations. And the Kodaka Nikaya is the minor collection. To those who are now referred to as Theravada, these are the only sutra that are Buddhist scripture Mahayana referred to these teachings as the Pali Canon. The Mahayana Canon, the phrase, thus have I heard, is indicative of sutra, whether it is the word of Shakyamuni Buddha or not. As a matter of fact, we know that the extant sutra, including the Pali Canon, did not contain Buddha's exact words because they were not recorded as he spoke. Furthermore, intelligence and mental capacities of the people who heard them differed. So the way in which they were understood and the content of the preaching differed. We could also add to this the translating process from indigenous local languages into Pali or Sanskrit would change not just the wording, but in some cases the meaning and intent of the, of the writers. As Buddhism spread across the Asian continent to a large extent following the Silk Road, it was influenced by many other traditions. And this led to the production of multilingual literature of Buddhism across Central Asia in language like Cotonese, which now is considered Middle Iranian, Sogdian, another form of Iranian, Uyghur, a Turkish language, Tangut, a Tibetan language written in a variant of Chinese script, Tibetan itself, and of course Chinese. The earliest texts were kept in folio, sheets of paper, wood, reed, or other media upon which were written and later printed texts. These were usually loose and strung together with string through holes in the media. The Mahayana Buddhist sutras were mostly written between the 1st century BCE and the 5th century CE, although a few may have been written as late as the 7th century CE. Most are said to have been originally written in Sanskrit, but very often the original Sanskrit has been lost, and the earliest version we have today is a Chinese translation. Nakamura Hajimi states, and I quote, unlike the various recensions of the Hinayana canon, which were virtually closed by the early centuries of the common era, in which shared, at least ideally, a common structure, the Mahayana scriptures were composed in a variety of desperate, the disparate social and religious environments over the course of several centuries. And they diverged widely from each other in content and outlook, and were in many cases meant to stand as individual works representing, it has been conjectured, rivals to the entire Hinayana corpus. By comparison, the scriptures of the Abrahamic tradition are given authority because they are believed to be revealed word of God or prophet. Buddhism is different. Although the sutras are recorded sermons of the historical Buddha, which are important, the real value of sutra is found in the wisdom reported in the sutra not in who said it. And I say this because I think we often have the notion of, well, what did Buddha really say? And the response I usually give is, we don't know. And I don't mean that in a dismissive term. It's, it's very real. And I think that then people have a worldview that is Abrahamic, if you're coming from the Euro-American perspective, which is a canonical word, word is a word of God. It's revealed. In Buddhism, that's not the case. 
the fact that Buddha may or may not have said it doesn't affect the authenticity and legitimacy of Mahayana script, Mahayana scripture. And I think that's often where we get lost. It's because we have this worldview which is derived from an Abrahamic perspective. Sutra in the Sanskrit canon, Mahayana Buddhists typically consider several major Mahayana sutras to have been taught by Shakyamuni Buddha, committed to memory and recited by his disciples, in particular Nanda, as I mentioned before. However, other Mahayana sutras are presented as being taught by other figures, such as bodhisattvas like Manjushri and Avalokitesavada. And there are various reasons that Indian Mahayana Buddhists gave to explain the fact that they only appeared at a later time, but I'm not going to go into that now because that gets involved. Euro-American scholarship tends to assume that the Mahayana canon are not the literal word of the historical Shakyamuni Buddha. Unlike the Srivaka critics, we have no possibility of knowing just who composed and compiled these texts, and for us, removed from time by the authors by up to two millennia, they are effectively an anonymous literature. There are different ways to group the many volumes of the Mahayana Sutra, and the grouping I am posing here is arguably perhaps the most relevant to Tendai Buddhism. And the first is the Prajnaparamita section. The main topics of these sutras are the path of the Bodhisattva, the six transcendent virtues, and in particular, transcendent wisdom. These include such notable examples as the Heart and Diamond Sutras. Following is the Siddharma Pandrika Sutra section, White Lotus of Good Dharma Sutra, is one of the most influential Mahayana sutras, particularly in East Asian Buddhism. Although composed in India, the Lotus Sutra became particularly important in China and Japan. In terms of Buddhist doctrine, it is renowned for two powerful proclamations by the Buddha. The first is that there are not three vehicles to enlightenment, but only one that all beings in the universe will one day become Buddhas, followed by the Buddha did not die and pass into nirvana. In fact, his lifespan is immeasurable. The sutra is also famous for its parables, like the parables of the burning house, the parable of the prodigal son, etc. The Lotus Sutra has been compiled together with two other sutras, which serve as a prologue and an epilogue, respectively, the Innumerable Meaning Sutra and the Shamatabhadra, Meditation Sutra. This com composite su sutra is often called the Threefold Lotus Sutra. Also very important is the Avatamsaka section. The Flower Garland Sutra, sometimes called the Flower Ornament Sutra, is a collection of smaller sutras that emphasize the interpenetration of all things. That is, all things and all beings not only reflect all other things and beings, but also the absolute in its totality. And then there's the Ratnakutta section. The Maharatnakutta Sutra contains 49 texts of varying lengths, which are termed assemblies by tradition. This collection includes the Shramala Devi, which we discussed on, during the Saturday uh, Sutra classes recently, the Longer Sukhavati, the uh, Ohaya Sutra, the Abhishoka Sutra, a long text called the Bodhi Patpataka, and many others. The Mahaparinirvana section, echoing and at one point even citing the Lotus Sutra, the Nirvana Sutra affirms that the Buddha's death or Parinirvana did not mean his destruction, but occurred to illustrate that the true body of a Buddha is the uncreated and eternal. No, we're, yeah, we're still there. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uncreated, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the sutras in this collection were important sources for Indian anthologies like the Shika Samukhaya of Shantideva, the Sutra Samukhaya, and is also a major source for the Ratnava Viga, and especially relies on the Dharani Vajra Sutras, which we discussed last week. Um, the esoteric section, or Mikyo, in general, the Buddhist tantras are classified separately from the Mahayana sutras. Though both types of texts are subsumed within the Mahayana tradition, the tantras are distinguished by a great variety of techniques of advanced meditations, incorporating rituals, incantations, and visualizations that are not found in other Mahayana sutras. And we also find 
such things as the um, Dainichi Niokai, which is the, the Mahavira Choir Chana Sutra, and, and others that are in this section. The Tibetan collections of sutra are virtually the same as the Mahayana and Tendai, though the groupings are slightly different, though they do emphasize some sutras in a different fashion than I'm emphasizing. And there's a brief tangent to our understanding of sutra, and that's the contributions to, to Chinese culture. <clears throat> On May 11th, 19th, uh, 868, the earliest reliable dated printed book was issued. And a Chinese copy of the Diamond Sutra, originally written in the first century CE, was found. Now I'll be succinct by quoting Xin Yi O. Quote, the penetration of Buddhism in, in China and its subsequent amalgamation with the native religious culture formulate an interesting enigma. The only foreign religion to embed itself into the hearts and minds of Chinese masses. Buddhism has gained an unprecedented success in comparison to numerous other religions such as Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, that were likewise spread along the Silk Road to China. And certainly many culminating factors must have played a role in the acceptance of a wholly new religion into an already sophisticated culture. The unstable social and political environment following the collapse of the Han Dynasty allowed for a chink in the traditional Chinese faith, through which Buddhism thought found entrance. The strategic transformation and dissemination of Buddhism in the early half of the first millennium provided the dissolution Chinese with a new hope of salvation, unquote. We can't, if we're gonna talk about sutras, we have to talk a little bit about translations. For Mahayana, Chinese was the most important language after Sanskrit. This would then be followed probably by uh, Tibetan, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese in no particular order. The earliest and for East Asia, the most important translations were from local languages and Sanskrit into Chinese. And I say local languages because when some of the um, in some of the translators had come from places other than um, India, they had come from. Well, we'll discuss that in a second. So many of these may have been in an oral tradition, written down earlier, later written down in Sanskrit. We don't know the exact order of some of the materials that had been written. Um, however. There are a number of translators that I want to uh, introduce. And keep in mind that Buddhism is reported as being introduced in China in 67 CE. And by that date, we're not talking about the diffuse entry of Buddhism into China, by which monks would have gone there and been heard and given teachings, etc. 67 was when the, the emperor had accepted Buddhism as a uh, formal uh, tradition. And keep in mind also that from a Chinese perspective, there wasn't, this was not a religion. This was something of a different category. It really dealt more as, as a way of a understanding of the way the heavens moved, the social um, milieu operated. The concept of religion is really a European concept. So I just want to point that out. Anne Chagall is especially notable and is unknown whether Anne Chagall was a monk or a lay person or whether he should have, be con have been considered a follower of Savastavada or Mahayana. He migrated eastward into China, settling in the Han capital Luyang in 148 CE. More than a dozen works by him are currently extant, including texts dealing with meditation, Abhidharma, and basic Buddhist doctrines. Lokasima was a Kushan Buddhist monk from Gandhara who traveled to China during the Han Dynasty from 147 to 189 CE. A characteristic of Lokasima translation style was the extensive transliteration of Indic terms and his retention of Indic stylistic features such as long sentences. 
He typically rendered Indic verse as Chinese prose, making no attempt to capture the meter. The uh, complication this time is that certain concepts in Indian traditions do not translate well into Chinese, and the rendering of the characters are difficult. An additional difficulty is that Chinese Buddhists attempted to interpret Buddhism through the more familiar and somewhat similar Taoist terminology in order to make Buddhism more comprehensible. From the very beginning, there was an understandable connection between Taoism and Buddhism, each advising the other regarding philosophy and practices. And so we find that Toan was responsible for correcting much of the Taoist terminology in Buddhism, though most scholars can see that the cross fertilization had already occurred between the two traditions. Now I'll mention just think, two things to keep the, to bear upon our reading of Sutra today. While the Indians preferred simple unadorned writing, the Chinese were fond of ornate polished writing. Remember that when the translations were done, they were translated, translated into a form that was understandable and is easily accepted by the Chinese. Another distinct difference is that when writers in Indian languages wish to emphasize the point, they, they repeated sentences several times in a similar fashion. They may repeat the same idea in subsequent paragraphs. Chinese, by contrast, felt that this detracted from the whole and eliminated much of the explanatory material. Finally, I'm going to talk about Kamara Jiva, who was one of the greatest translators of Sutra from Sanskrit into Chinese. A Buddhist monk, scholar, missionary, and translator, originally from what is now called Kashmir, we have discussed his capture, imprisonment, and release by the Chinese previously, so I won't go into that now. He was aware of the fact that the sutra were originally spoken aloud and took great care to fashion a sense that would convey the original meaning correctly and be euphonious. All subsequent translations of the Chinese followed Kumar Jiva's models. And in conclusion, I have an admission to make. This topic got away from me. It was much more to discuss than the time that we have this evening. So I got about one quarter of the way through what I intended to discuss. Even an overview requires more discipline than I had. Sutra are the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, his disciples and masters, who had followed the teachings in the Indic subcontinent, South Asia, Central Asia, East Asia, and beyond. They were compiled at different periods of time by individuals in groups who had inspiration as a result of following the Buddhist path. While they were not the exact words of Shakyamuni Buddha, they were, at the very least, following the spirit and the wisdom of his teachings. When people say to me, but what did the Buddha say? I have two thoughts. The first is that Shakyamuni Buddha was not a divinity in the way that a monotheistic God is considered a divinity. He was a human being who had attained Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, unexcelled, complete enlightenment. And this doesn't mean that he was a superhuman. It means that he had seen completely into the nature of reality in this state, and it ruled his life. But it, the sutra are not revealed doctrine. The second is that his teachings are not a self-help program the way we think of it today with hundreds of books telling us how to live a more complete individualistic life. His teaching was how to live and die in a way that is in harmony with nature, our society, and ourselves, and most importantly, what we need to do and what we need to know to attain awakening. And these are some of the resources that I used this evening. I'll just let you gaze at that for a moment. And we'll go on to <laughs> questions and comments. And so first I'll ask Kichishima Sensei if he has any comments he would like to make. Well, thank you. Uh, it reminds me about 34 years ago, I had a chance to visit China and I came across uh, tremendous numbers of Sanskrit uh, uh, sutras and documents preserved in the library. 
now the, uh, all of them now pre, uh, moved to original maybe uh, Potara in Tibet. And uh, among them, uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Takahashi, uh, he came across uh, the long lost uh, scriptures of the Bimara Kirti near Desha. And uh, that was published, uh, and many people now uh, had a chance to see original Sanskrit text. It is very uh, important, uh, I think, scriptures. Uh, so, I, I anyway, in China, uh, when, uh, you know, they translated from original Sanskrit into Chinese language, uh, they maybe burn down original Sanskrit uh, text. Uh, I don't know why, but I think uh, they would like to not to uh, imitate uh, things uh, to translate. And so anyway, uh, all the most of the documents of Sanskrit text disappeared from China. But in Tibet, in the case of Tibet, they preserved original Sanskrit and uh, and translated all of most of them into Tibetan language. So uh, this is a different uh, culture between Tibet and uh, chi China. Uh, it is amazing. Uh, for instance, uh, Japanese uh, uh, prince uh, Shotoku Taishi, uh, sixth century, uh, he he he. he uh, made a commentary to the major three uh, texts of Mahayana, such as Roda Sutra and uh, Shrimara Devi Sutra and the uh, Bhimara Kirti Nirudesha. And the uh, only Bhimara Kirti Nirudesha, Yuima Kyo, uh, we couldn't find original Sanskrit mm -hmm. text, but uh, uh, quite recently. Uh, they are discovered, and uh, it's uh, very uh, nice to preserve all of them now. Uh, this is my, uh, what shall I say, uh, feeling. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Sensei. Thank you. And we're going to um, stop the recording. And somebody had their hand up.